Good morning, and thank you for your interest in Meridian Energy Group. Um, welcome to the first quarter 2019 update and webinar. Uh, my name is Stephen Yolma. I'm the Vice President of Business Development. But before we get started, uh, we're going to have Grant Downing, our in-house counsel, read some forward-looking statements. Grant? Uh, thank you, Stephen. The following statement applies to information contained in this presentation. Some of the information in this presentation may contain projections or other forward-looking statements regarding future events or the future financial performance of the company. We wish to caution you that these statements are only predictions, and those actual events or results may differ materially. Merging has written materials addressing factors which could impact our forward-looking statements, which will be made available upon request. These documents contain and identify important factors that could cause the actual results to differ materially from those contained in our projections or forward-looking statements, including, among others, potential fluctuations in quarterly and annual results, product or project development, current and future contracts, business and project strategies, rapid technological and or market changes, acquisition strategy, production risks, volatility of stock price, financial risk management, and future growth subject to risks. The company disclaims any duty to update the information presented here. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. And now I'd like to introduce uh, the chairman and CEO of Meridian Energy Group, William C. Prinis. Uh, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> um, the first slide you see up on the, on the screen uh, packs a lot of information into a small spot. Um, before I get started on this, uh, this uh, set of slides, I should give some credit to CIBC, who put together a larger slideshow, actually about 70 pages, uh, from which we've extracted these uh, 15 or 16 slides to show you today. <clears throat> the uh, plus, you know, after I go through these slides, we have about uh, 15 questions that have been sent in by investors. And we're grateful for that. Uh, I always want to focus my comments on what's of interest to the investors. Uh, so we will deal with those after the slideshow. Um, as you can see from the map there on the right, uh, there are a lot of areas of the United States and Canada that are now known as uh, the known oil shale basins in the country. Uh, because of the, the advent of this uh, shale revolution, this country is seeing an increase in the amount of light, sweet, <coughs> excuse me, crude oil that's available. And the industry can't really handle it. The refining capacity of the country is geared towards a, a heavier barrel of oil. Uh, that and some other factors we'll talk about throughout this uh, slideshow uh, provide us with an opportunity to do something different. When I was given the opportunity to get involved in Meridian about five or six years ago, uh, we, of course, were only looking at the Davis refinery up in North Dakota. The site had been selected, and I started to dig in and, and recognize that this is an opportunity to do something entirely different in this industry, uh, to build a clean, smaller refinery that's uh, got a rifle shot design at this particular crude oil. Um, building the team that enabled me to get this project put together at the status it's at right now uh, allowed me to select people who had a similar frame of mind. They were uh, pretty much tired of doing business the way they had been for the last 20, 30 years of their career and wanted to do something different and uh, more valuable for the industry. What we've come up with as a result of developing Davis and getting it permitted and designed is a new kind of refinery. It's smaller, sleeker, it's clean. Um, it does not have excess capital invested in it for crude oils that are, it's never going to see. Uh, it's a very simple design focused on a single crude oil. And in fact, Bakken crude oil is probably the best crude oil in this country or North America as far as processing is concerned. Uh, we have very few uh, byproducts. Uh, almost all of what goes in comes out again as useful refined product. Um, this is now the basis of a 
a program that we've embarked on where Davis is the first of a group of refineries that will be built around the country to address the opportunity of these new shale basins. <clears throat> Let's go ahead. The basic uh, value model here is, is uh, presented in this uh, second slide. Um, first of all, we wanted to pull together a refinery design, a set of refineries that would lead the industry in terms of environmental compliance. The country does not need any more big, old, dirty refineries. The technology is now out there to build a cleaner type of refinery, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, we also are looking for opportunities where we can locate these refineries next to the crude oil. So we're not looking at excessive transportation costs to get the crude to the refinery and then shipping it all the way back to the market. As you can see in a later slide, the products from this uh, refinery can be absorbed in the local market. There's no need to send the crude oil to the Gulf Coast and then diesel and gasoline all the way back. Um, also, because you're focusing on a single crude, there's no need for excessive complexity in the refinery. It can be a very simple design, which is what we've done at Davis. Also, in doing this at Davis, uh, we've developed a new model. It can be applied to different locations, and that's what we're going to do to magnify the returns to the investors. And again, you know, strategically um, positioned sites, uh, smaller, sleeker, cleaner refineries right next to the crude serving local markets. You'll see the map um, on this slide on the right. Um, that's of the Davis refinery area. The green dots that tend to run together in this area are uh, existing oil wells uh, that are penetrating and producing oil from the Bakken formation. Uh, what we're doing is having a pipeline built down to the refinery from the center of that formation, which uh, you see a a location on the map called Johnson's Corner. A uh, pipeline goes down to the refinery, uh, which is located on rail, on highway, and in uh, you know, a location that has otherwise uh, good logis logistics for the project. Um, the project is very far along. We're, we've already started construction. Uh, it's fully permitted. It's being built at a size uh, 49,500 barrels per day which in the industry is relatively small, but when you're putting these plants next to the resource serving local market, uh, excessive size is not an advantage. Uh, it's being built on a, a 700 acre site of which it will occupy only about 150 acres. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, the, uh, the siting permits and air quality permits, uh, water access permits, all of that has been accomplished. The air quality permit was awarded last June, uh, almost a year ago. Uh, we began construction at the Davis site in July, and quite a bit of the earthwork has already been done. I mentioned earlier the efficiency of our refinery applied to this uh, Bakken crude oil. The pie chart down at the bottom, uh, you can see that uh, there's very few products that are not uh, very clean transportation fuel even what would usually be called residual in a refinery, in our case, qualifies under the IMO 2020 specs for low sulfur marine fuel. So everything that comes out of this refinery is a valuable product. Again, the investment highlights for Davis uh, as a standalone project uh, it is, uh, as I say, shovel ready. Uh, we're in detailed design now, and it is going to get built. Uh, we designed it to be the cleanest refinery on the planet. It will be so when it's done. Uh, I have a slide later on that shows the details of how we accomplish that and how it stacks up to competing refineries. Um, having a blank uh, sheet of paper and empty piece of ground for this plant, we started uh, from scratch. We have no legacy technology to deal with. Uh, we could take advantage of all the technological improvements 
that have been made in the last 50 years. And this is the first full conversion refinery to be built in, I think, 44 years in the United States. <clears throat> we have a site located um, in a logistically perfect location near all the crude, uh, near all the logistics necessary to get out to market. Um, the site uh, itself is geologically uh, excellent. There, there are no issues regarding uh, uh, any you know, site-specific uh, geological problems. It's a picture-perfect location. All the permits are secured. Um, one of the things we've done, uh, indicated by bullet point five there, is when you do something different in an industry that's been around as long as refining, you have to do some things quite a bit different in order to track the capital to mitigate risk. Uh, that's what we've done, and there's a, a slide dedicated to the uh, contractual uh, commitments that we are pulling together to support this project financing. Uh, the economics of putting a plant uh, next to the crew, next to the market, and not spending so much on construction because it's a very simple design focused on a single crude uh, allows us to increase the margins that you would otherwise see in the refining business. We have a slide later on that shows how this stacks up against competing uh, business models in the refining business. And last but not least, uh, over the last several years, we pulled together one of the best management teams in this business. Again, it's uh, you know professionals in the industry that did not want to do things the old way. And they they have dived into this project and helped create tremendous value um, through the innovations that we've created here. Um, in terms of environmental compliance, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, the the country does not need any more big, ugly, dirty refineries. There's no excuse for it given today's, um, today's uh, technology. Uh, we've got 50 years worth of technology that has not really been fully employed by the business. Um, you, if you can see that graph at the lower right, uh, that was a graph that was created by the Air Quality Division of the North Dakota Department of Health when we were going through the public comment phase of our air quality permit. The little tiny boxes over on the far right uh, show the air emissions levels of the Meridian refinery. Uh, the bigger boxes over on, excuse me, on the left show the Meridian. Over on the right, the taller boxes are the uh, emissions levels shown by the closest refinery to our, the, uh, the Marathon Refinery in Mandan, North Dakota. <clears throat> I'm not trying to make fun of them or anything. They're dealing with a very old plant and doing the best they can, keeping that as a clean operation. But you can see the comparison. On a per barrel capacity basis, our refinery is about one eighth of the emissions of the industry average refinery. Again, you know, hydrocarbons are pollution. Uh, a lot of pollution is just bad engineering. When crude oil is $5 a barrel, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend money to prevent those hydrocarbons from getting out away from you. But with crude oil at $60, $70 a barrel, and with the ability of building a plant that turns those hydrocarbons into products that are worth $160 a barrel, pollution is just bad practice. So those hydrocarbons are captured and used in the process and become part of the product mix. Um, there's a lot of material on this slide that I won't go through, um, but I want to point out that uh, in North Dakota, we applied for air quality permits in October of 2016. Uh, we expected a fairly quick review, but the state agencies uh, were very concerned about uh, having a contentious project uh, running through their, their process in an expedited manner and really put us through the ringer, including bringing EPA in as part of the, the review. As a result, we faced probably one of the most grueling review processes in the industry for this refinery, and we passed with flying colors. Uh, not only that, but because the state involved EPA, EPA is very familiar with what we're doing, 
and now recognizes that we are experts in this area. On the design, again, there's a lot of detail here. Uh, it's a very simple process. It does take crude oil that's valued at $50 to $60 a barrel. Uh, I recently drove by a gas station here in California where premium gasoline was at $4.10 a gallon. So you're taking a product that comes out of the ground and is worth about 50, and you're turning it into a product that's worth about $160 a barrel. Everything else that's built into the, that gasoline price is taxes or the cost of moving it around. The real value that's created there is created by this refinery. It's a very simple design. We're relying on some proprietary technology uh, from firms like Axons uh, to make it uh, even more simple and clean. Um, you know, it's, it's a very clean operating refinery as we discussed. And this design, basic design, is the basis of our other projects that we're going to be developing. This is the slide that kind of breaks down the, the comfortable uh, economics of Davis versus other refineries in the business. Uh, the ones on the right, those three columns, are existing plants that are out there that are used as comps. They're, they're uh, publicly available uh, information on these plants because these are public companies. Uh, the bottom line here is that the, uh, the column on the left, which is the Davis refinery, we end up, because of the proximity to the, the crude oil, proximity to the markets, the operating cost and the clean nature of, of our operation, our net crack spread, which is our gross profit margin, is much higher than other entities in the business, even though we're smaller. So we don't have the economies of scale of a giant uh, refinery on the coast. <clears throat> Uh, the markets uh, here locally are in our favor, as shown by this slide. Uh, we're going to use less than 4% of the crude oil uh, that's produced in this area. We're not going to significantly impact the price of crude oil uh, by being there. Um, on the market side, you can see uh, that North Dakota itself can absorb all of our products. Um, we're also, well, we're actually going to be marketing our products throughout the middle continent area. Uh, you know, every, every place from Minneapolis to Denver and over into Salt Lake City. So the, the market is much broader than that. Um, it was kind of funny to have it pointed out to us early in this process that, you know, all of these uh, markets, all of these uh, gas stations are getting their products from somebody else already. So it's not like there are you know, cars and tractors and diesels that are sitting there empty because we don't have a refinery locally. It's because the, the industry has become so complacent and well-organized. The thought of a competitive new entry in this market is kind of foreign and scary to people in this industry. <clears throat> well, you know, Meridian is an aggressive competitor in this business. We intend to compete for and to take good care of these customers. And you know, we have already seen in terms of market acceptance and the willingness to enter into contracts with us for product from a plant that's a couple of years away yet, that the market is ready for a new entrant that cares about taking care of these customers. This is kind of a blow up on the right here of the area around the refinery. Again, you can see Johnson's Corner right in the middle. And that red line down to the refinery uh, represents a new pipeline that's being built to serve the refinery. Um, the basic geology or geography of this is, is just so important to our, our profitability that it's worth emphasizing. We are so close to the crude and that's, that's crude oil that has to find a way out of this area at great expense. So having a refinery right there is just another place to get rid of some crude oil. And we get the advantage of that logistics, that, that location in terms of a discount off of the WTI benchmark price for crude oil there. 
Uh, we also have access uh, right there at the site to the infrastructure to get the products out. A lot of our products will go out by truck locally, serve local markets, which are not actually well served by the current uh, companies serving that area. Now the rest will go out by, by train uh, to other nearby markets and regions. <clears throat> Again, a rundown on where we are with uh, the Davis refinery at this site. Uh, there's a map at the bottom that shows a little bit more detail uh, where the plant's located. The picture right next to it uh, shows looking east over the top of the existing uh, Bakken link uh, crude by rail terminal. Uh, the empty field just on the other side of that is where the refinery will be. Uh, you can see the massive rail uh, infrastructure in the area represented by that, that crude by rail platform. Um, this project is, is done. Uh, we are completing the financing over the next couple of months and we will be back in construction and fabrication on the Davis refinery um, once that financing is closed. Right now we're completing detailed designs. Uh, all of the permits are in place. All of the utility requirements are in place. So this project is ready to go. I mentioned earlier that uh, a new type of project uh, as a, a entrant into a rather well organized or complacent industry requires a new way of doing things to mitigate the risk and attract capital. Um, the way we've done uh, Davis uh, will be replicated on other projects. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of contract formation and risk mitigation that has to be undertaken. Um, in terms of technology and design, which uh, is that set of agreements and, and requirements necessary to mitigate completion and project performance risk, uh, we have done a lot of engineering ourselves, uh, completed all the permits, and we've entered into a long-term agreement with uh, McDermott International, which is a a fairly big uh, publicly traded uh, engineering construction firm. And under the agreement with them, uh, they will be building the Davis refinery under a firm fixed price contract with uh, significant performance and completion guarantees. So we know going into the project financing how much money we have to raise and how that's going to be spent. Um, getting the crude oil to the refinery uh, uh, the terms under which we get the crew, the logistics, uh, and how we uh, get the products out to the market is the uh, subject of those next three major bullets. Uh, we've uh, entered into an agreement with producers midstream to build the pipeline to come down to the refinery and to aggregate uh, the crude supplies from the Johnson's Corner area. Um, those agreements for crude oil will be longer term agreements and will allow us to take advantage of the, the discounts to the WTI index price uh, based upon our location right next to the field. Uh, product offtake, again, those are going to be long term agreements where there's firm commitment to take product under uh, pricing indices that are related to the WTI baseline index, and we will be able to hedge again against that index to protect our crack spread. <clears throat> the financial strategy uh, uh, for the project and for the company uh, follows those, those requirements, those commitments that we need. Uh, we've been financing the uh, growth of the company through an internal raise since the day we opened the door. We're continuing to do that. Uh, we've raised a total of $40 million, uh, a little over 40, I guess 45 now. Uh, since inception of the company, including friends and family and founders, uh, we went through a common stock offering that ended last year, and now we're uh, uh, five to ten million into a preferred stock offering that covers all of our expenses on Davis, uh, leading up to the project financing, and also provides the capital we need for the follow-on projects, including uh, Texas and Oklahoma. The uh, actual project financing for Davis is uh, a $1.1 billion uh, non-recourse project financing, and we have engaged uh, CIBC, who I mentioned earlier, is our principal 
financial advisor on that financing, and CIBC and Morgan Stanley are both engaged as placement agents for that project financing. Yeah. Uh, this table uh, shows the impact of doing Davis plus a series of, uh, of follow-on projects. Um, we have already selected a site and secured a site for the second project down in Texas. Uh, that site could actually accommodate a couple of these uh, refineries. We're also in negotiation on a site for a, a third location in Cushing, Oklahoma, which is near the, uh, the massive uh, tank farm uh, complex that exists in that area for both Permian and Bakken crude oil. This gives us a, a fairly good run, a, a runway for multiple projects with accretive value. Uh, Davis alone, if you look at the bottom of this uh, of this chart, uh, if we just did Davis starting up in 2021, um, based on the EBITDA multiples that are out there in the market today, you will have earned uh, 28, 30 percent on an investment at eight dollars in our preferred stock. As we add projects going forward, uh, those values they're they're modules of value for the investor. Um, we are looking right now at, let's say, three to four years from now, being in operation on at least two projects, one in, in West uh, Texas and the Davis Project in North Dakota, at a little over 100,000 barrels per day. Um, that gives us the ability to show value that would be in the $20, $30, $40 range. Uh, if we go ahead and, and look out you know, five to six years, uh, we will have line of sight on up to 350,000 barrels per day and accretive value of in the 70s and 80s in terms of dollars per share. Uh, interesting to note as uh, actually some of the questions that were asked by shareholders I'll deal with later uh, talked about this ramp up in value. And you should note that we spent so much money on Davis because of it being a new type of project that the best way for us to show value to the shareholders for that investment is to apply that knowledge, that intellectual property to follow on projects. And so our investment required to get to the project financing and completion of each subsequent plant is substantially lower. Uh, the dilution that's incurred in getting to the point where we can uh, project finance each separate plant is lower. So the value ramp up is significant as we go forward. In terms of ramping up the project, uh, uh, concept developed on Davis, uh, the map on the upper right shows the uh, state of Texas with a green uh, star where the second site has been secured. <clears throat> it's a uh, two section area of land that we've uh, optioned uh, just north of the city of Kermit. Uh, this area is uh, enough to site up to four of these Davis style projects. Uh, we're gonna start out with one that's uh, virtually identical to Davis, but because of the uh, air permitting issues in the area, it can be somewhat larger to start with. And that will be our model moving forward. Uh, there was another copy of that map showing the major shale basins there on the lower right, uh, showing Permian and Cushing, which are our next targets. Uh, we're looking at, at other locations, including Eagleford. Uh, there's been an interest in having us site one of these projects up in Canada. And uh, there are other parts of the United States that are somewhat larger, smaller uh, shale areas where we could put similar uh, projects. Uh, right now, uh, Davis is uh, nearing completion of the project financing in several months, and that will be uh, completed a couple of years after that. And uh, the West Texas site is ready for us to start design and the permitting work. Um, the proceeds of the preferred offering that we're in the middle of now will get us to the project financing on Davis and get us uh, through permits on West Texas and uh, the Cushing project will get that started. 
Um, these next two so slides are uh, dealing with the management team. Again, we've, we've pulled people from uh, many different uh, large company backgrounds who are open to the idea of doing things quite a bit differently. And that's what we're doing at uh, Meridian, but we're utilizing the best and brightest in the industry to get there. Um, the uh, details regarding these uh, these uh, gentlemen and, and the resumes are, there's more detail in the uh, private placement memo if you want to dig into that. Uh, that's it for the slide portion. We can get into some of the, the questions here in a minute. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, I know that we did have some questions that came in from shareholders, and uh, I believe we have a list of them. And I think we should kind of hit some of those highlights. <coughs> um, sure. The the first well, first of all, we received several uh, questions. We we tried to summarize. Uh, uh, the answers to some so that we can cut down on the time. Uh, so if you don't hear the question that you would ask uh, verbatim, uh, please bear with me. Uh, first one, uh, first six questions actually deal with construction and, and production timelines. Uh, first question is, what is the timeline for construction of Davis uh, during 2019? Um, the, the main for, focus for this year is to advance the engineering so that the fabrication of the equipment and the modules can begin for the project, because that's a critical path. Uh, this project is going to be heavily modularized because of weather uh, issues in the area being so severe. Uh, I've worked on refinery and power projects all over the world, including uh, the North Slope of Alaska, uh, Valdez, Alaska. And by and large, the weather restrictions working in North Dakota are more severe than in Alaska, uh, which I was surprised to find out. But we're going to work around that through modularization. And that means you have a different timeline that doesn't focus so much on what happens in the ground on any given day. Uh, we've already begun site work uh, last year. There's some additional site work that needs to be done this year. Um, all of that work is going to now be done by McDermott under our agreement with them. And we're not really going to worry about foundations until uh, probably uh, later in 2019, but mostly in 2020 is when the heavy concrete work will start to take place. Um, next question, uh, wondering about the status of road improvements. Um, the, the site is is not real remote, but road conditions around the site are geared for agricultural use and not for the transport of very heavy equipment, including uh, modules. So the roads have to be improved. Uh, right now, we think we're going to hold off on that until early 2020, rather than doing the road improvements this summer. Um, you know, part of that is just not needing to do it until the heavy modules start to arise or arrive at the site. But also, uh, the project financing is such that uh, we actually uh, benefit more by delaying uh, any expenditures that are not on the critical path. So that helps us save money. <clears throat> Third question, uh, will the necessary buildings be built before next winter so the piping can continue during the cold months? Um, the question really speaks to the modularization and the winterization of the project. Uh, a lot of projects that are in a very tight footprint uh, end up being uh, encased in a building to enable uh, work to be done year-round. But a refinery is just too spread out. Uh, even a, a, a small, sleek one like uh, the Davis refinery is too spread out to be totally enclosed. So the way we handle that is just doing an awful lot of the work that otherwise would be subject to, to weather restrictions uh, in a shop someplace uh, in the Gulf Coast or even overseas uh, where it's, uh, uh, you know, that part of the plan is put into a module. And the work that's done on the site involves the uh, foundation's work and putting the modules together. Uh, that Part of the project can be done under temporary buildings that are put up at that time. But again, we're not going to enclose the entire project. We're just going to modularize to deal with the weather. 
Uh, fourth question, will the housing community be built concurrently so workers can live there during construction? <clears throat> um, we were a lot more worried uh, several years ago about the housing situation than we are now. Uh, many people from the North Dakota remember the housing shortages due to the, uh, the explosion and efforts on the Bakken uh, oil field. Uh, for temporary construction type housing, uh, we're entering into a uh, strategic relationship with Target, um, which is a firm that's been operating uh, man camps up in the North Dakota area for quite a while. Uh, we're comfortable that they can accommodate the construction manpower at the site uh, to make sure that they have a place to go. Um, in terms of the permanent uh, employees of the refinery, we're no longer concerned about that. I mean, we're ready, uh, we're observing the situation in terms of the housing market to make sure we don't need to worry about it. But there is uh, quite a bit of uh, housing available in the surrounding communities, including Dickinson. So we're not going to uh, go through the effort of trying to make sure that we provide housing. We'll just keep an eye on that situation. Uh, fifth question, are there different companies building the rail living community and refinery? Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we've selected McDermott to uh, design and build a refinery for us under that single contract. That allows us to have a single point of responsibility uh, from a big creditworthy uh, entity like McDermott to complete those, those facilities for us. And uh, our job is to police that and make sure that this is a project that's built properly and that we can start up but that we're not gonna piecemeal out the agreements for various areas of the project. That said, uh, McDermott is the first one to admit that there's a great deal of logic in uh, making sure that there's a lot of uh, local subcontractors and that the uh, relationship with local community is strong. Uh, so there is going to be quite a bit of subcontracting and local vendors that will be contracted for during the construction of the project, but it's all going to be under the uh, McDermott banner. <clears throat> Sixth question, uh, when do we anticipate the date of our first production uh, of crude oil? Uh, we first start feeding crude oil to the project uh, when we begin startup. Uh, startup will be anywhere from 24 to 30 months following the close of the Davis project financing which we're anticipating to be in the July timeframe now. Um, startup will take a month or two, but uh, all the products of, of, uh, that are coming out of that startup process will actually be marketable products. So we begin production at that point in time. Uh, we had one question on litigation. Um, uh, the full question, uh, will cement footings for the modular equipment uh, also be completed in 2019. If not, is the reason due to any remaining legal matters not resolved? Um, on the schedule part of that question, again, as I said earlier, there'll be some additional uh, site work to be done over the next three or four months. As soon as the weather clear, clears and the ground dries out. Um, if you live up in North Dakota, uh, you're aware of the fact that there's uh, been a deluge out at the site for the last couple of days is continuing and they're expecting snow uh, this coming weekend. And uh, you know it's late April. Uh, whenever it rains like that and you're working on, on bare ground, it takes uh, several weeks to dry out. So you know, we're probably not looking at being able to work on the site until late May, uh, early June anyway. Uh, we will go ahead and complete the remaining site work at that point and there might be some foundation work uh, completed during the uh, 2019 construction season, which usually extends up through Thanksgiving. But again, the foundations out there for this year are not on critical path. Uh, so it's only going to be the foundations that we require for equipment that's going to be arriving at the site uh, in early 2020. Um, now, the meat of that question was litigation. Yeah, litigation. Uh, does have an impact. Um, you know, concerns about litigation uh, do have an impact on our financing, and to the extent that slows down, then that slows the project down. 
Um, we have already had substantial delays due to the permit delays on air quality uh, and litigation relating to all of our permits. Even though we've won every step of the way, um, you know, people read about that in the paper and so they get concerned. So yes, there is an impact of litigation on the project, but we've worked our way through it and uh, all of our legal challenges have been met successfully. <clears throat> um, a series of questions on financing issues. Uh, the first one, uh, what is the agreement with the two investment banking firms that Meridian has engaged? Uh, we've engaged CIBC, uh, Canadian Imperial Bank Corp, uh, which is a large bank and investment bank out of Canada. And they have a long, long history in energy project financing. They are our principal uh, financial advisor on the project financing. We've uh, hired both CIBC and Morgan Stanley, who most of you are familiar with, a very large U.S. investment bank. Uh, they are the placement agents and peer investment banking firms for the project financing. Uh, that project financing uh, consists of about $1.1 billion. It covers all the construction costs of the project and all the ancillary facilities and the cost of the, the owner, Meridian, uh, our staff, through that construction period. Um, right now, um, that will probably, we think, consist of about $300 million in debt and $800 million in equity. Uh, the low proportion of debt to equity is because it's a first-of-a-time project and uh, you know, people are risk-averse and want to make sure that, uh, that this first project gets done um, before they ramp up the, the whole debt coverage uh, or debt portion of the overall financing amount. Um, you know, as we show that this entire formula works out well in terms of the contracts and the way the, perform or the facility performs, we would expect to see the amount of debt on each project go up incrementally. Uh, next financial question, uh, are there plans for the company to go public? Um, yes, uh, a public offering of the company is uh, the preferred way to uh, have the investors gain liquidity. Uh, it used to be that uh, you had to have three years of uh, successful, profitable operation before you could even consider going public. Uh, that, that whole paradigm has changed uh, through the dot-com era. And now we're being advised that the best time for us to think about doing that is in about three, four years when Davis is in operation. Uh, we're bringing Walton Station down in Texas into operation. That gives us a, uh, you know, a capacity in operation at that time of over 100,000 barrels per day and, uh, and has proven our business model. At that point, I think an IPO is, is worth considering. Uh, in the interim, you know, as a company proves its value, um, there is an opportunity as we go through the project financing for various entities to kind of see what we're doing and, and see the value of it. So if there is an opportunity that's presented to us where we could uh, uh, sell part of the company, uh, where selling shareholders could participate, then it's our job to make sure that we do the best deal for our shareholders, and we'll take that into account. Um, next financial question, uh, will Meridian list any common preferred shares in the market? Um, you know, there's a way to kind of sneak into a, a public uh, scenario by just uh, starting registration uh, of your existing shares out there. Um, I think it's a little bit better to do a formal IPO uh, with a, uh, SEC registration, I think we get better bang for a buck at that point. But yeah, if, if an IPO for some reason doesn't um, seem like it's in the cards, then we would take steps to allow shareholders to gain liquidity through private sales or whatever means was then available in the market. Uh, financial question uh, four, what percent of funding for plant one, two, and three is planned from debt and market or from debt at market rates. Uh, as mentioned earlier, of the 1.1 billion for Davis, uh, we're looking at 300 million of that being debt. Uh, 
all things being equal, debt is cheaper than equity. Um, you know, if you look in the market, uh, equity is expecting a return of like 15% uh, debt because of its preferences um, is more like uh, six to eight percent. So we're highly motivated to uh, increase debt and raise less equity. Um, so I think that we're going to end up uh, gradually creeping up to where there's a more optimized uh, uh, capital structure for each project after Davis. I think we'll probably end up somewhere between 45 to 65 percent debt, uh, the rest equity on subsequent projects. <clears throat> is, uh, next question, is Meridian placing any equity debt offering of the $1.1 billion? Uh, does that allow for overages on the first plant and capital to begin construction on the second Permian plant without additional second capital raise? Um, the, the way projects are financed, Davis will be uh, financed under a single purpose entity. Uh, all of the money going into that project finance vehicle uh, is going to be dedicated only to Davis. Uh, we have to invest that money uh, to protect uh, not only uh, Meridian, but the project investors at that level want to make sure that we're focusing solely on Davis and not trying to preserve capital for a subsequent project. Uh, so uh, I'm pretty much assured that we will not be able to apply any capital from the Davis project financing to the subsequent project. Now, because of that, what we've done, first of all, um, the, the investors on the first project financing major institutions will probably be the investors on the second project. So as we get Davis built and into operation, they will have a, a chance to see how we operate and will be the guys that will be first considered for participation in the Walton Station refinery, which will be plant number two. <clears throat> However, uh, we're not going to wait for that. Um, the preferred offering that we're doing right now, most of those proceeds will go to uh, driving Davis through the project financing, but a significant amount of the proceeds from the preferred will go into design and permitting on the Walton Station plant in Texas and perfecting our site control and getting started on design in Cushing, Oklahoma. So anybody who invests in the preferred offering is going to profit from not only Davis, but also the subsequent plant. Um, regarding uh, preferred sh shares, uh, next question. The 6% annual interest payment is expected to be occurring for data purchase. Uh, I think that was a clarification question. Yeah, the, the coupon on the preferred uh, dates from the data purchase on the preferred. Um, next question, is there a rough time frame of when the Meridian Board will vote on paying out the accumulated interest to shareholders? Um, those dividends um, on preferred uh, accumulate until we can pay. Uh, generally speaking, we're not allowed by law to pay out uh, interest or coupons on the preferred until we can do so from qualified earnings from operations. So actual payouts to the preferred owners uh, would not occur until after Davis is in operation. Uh, I think the greatest value there is in that accumulated uh, uh, interest uh, to be applied to equity because that's where you're going to see the highest value in that three-year window. <coughs> Um, last one, uh, or second to last one, is the agreement based on all allocated shares and amount per share whereby all shares have been sold to existing shareholders would hold 25% and the bankers and their customers would hold 75%. Um, yeah, that, that seems to go to the calculation of uh, value as between Meridian as the parent company and the project itself. Uh, what we do there is each project, as I mentioned earlier, is owned by a single purpose entity, and that entity is the vehicle for the actual project financing. Uh, once the smoke clears in that project financing for Davis, uh, the guys that invest the equity at the project level would own 75% of that entity, uh, 
and Meridian retains that 25%. Um, that pattern is, is kind of a tried and true uh, formula in the oil business. It's called a third for quarter. In other words, uh, you know, you, you contribute a third of the capital, you get a quarter of the deal. We keep a, we keep a quarter because we're doing every project as a full 100% non-recourse project financing. So we keep that 25%, the other equity coming in at the project level gets the other two thirds, or excuse me, three quarters of the plan. Um, we then, you know, will continue on and operate the plant and get our share as we go forward. And that's an extremely valuable share. Uh, it's worth noting that, you know, as you increase the amount of debt financing as a proportion of total capital for each project, we might be able to keep more than the 25%. You know, if you have uh, less than one half of the equity at the project level coming in from, from equity, or the rest of it's debt, then they make higher returns even if they get less of the project interest. So we're going to, after we get beyond Davis, look at being able to structure the projects in a way that still gives a, a really good return to that project equity investor but magnifies the, uh, the uh, profit to Meridian's investors who are the ones that took the original risk on the project. <clears throat> um, we have been working through the, uh, the uh, preferred offering for several months now and have been in negotiation with several participants at a, a major substantial investment level. And I think that gave rise to this uh, final question. Uh, just recently, we reissued the uh, private placement memo showing that we have repriced the preferred stock at $8 per share. It was at $10 per share. Uh, the reason we've done that is uh, based on those negotiations, uh, we have the ability to accelerate the, the rate at which we're pulling this capital in and quite frankly, my job moving these projects forward and getting Davis financed, uh, I can't move fast enough if we don't accelerate the capital rate. So uh, that was primarily my decision. The board approved it last week and we have reduced the price so that we can ramp up the rate at which we get this preferred done. Uh, I would like to see it get done uh, here in the May, maybe halfway in the June timeframe because we really do need to get going on these other projects to lock in a, a first mover advantage using our intellectual property of what a refinery should look like. Uh, so that's the explanation on that change in price. Um, that's it for the questions. Um, did you want to hit the yeah. context? So uh, first of all, thank you, Bill, for giving clarity to where we are with Meridian. Uh, I'd also like to thank our shareholders for your ongoing support. Interested parties, if you require a clarification or a different uh, or additional information, please feel free to reach out uh, to the company with the details below and we'd be happy to send you additional information or explain anything that you're not clear on. At this point, once again, thank you very much for your time. We look forward to uh, keeping you comprised as to you know, the, the progress of the company and the continued success.